video. And then I will fill in any gaps that you need that I think you, you should have filled. And, um, and hopefully by the end of the two hours, you guys will have a good grasp of what regulates the mail and the female reproductive systems. Especially the menstrual, the menstrual cycle, it's always confusing to the blood students. So, um, and, and I guess the first part of this builds on um, what uh, Dr. Um, uh, presented on the histology of the male reproductive system. So, uh, you know, you guys are very lucky to have a person like that lecturing to you because he's, I mean, I was sitting at the back there thinking, I don't know, no bad. It's just amazing to, to have that um, amount of knowledge in my head. Um, I've got to keep out of the fact that it started with the vascular system, just like that, changed the moment <laughs> track without blinking an eye. So you're very lucky. Alright, so um, let's see what Dr. Tim's got to say. I haven't seen this. Um, Let's look at male reproductive endocrinology and during an endearingly called Lecture XX. <laughs> when we're talking or thinking about male reproductive endocrinology, we need to consider five hormones. Uh, gonadotropic releasing hormone, or GNRH, FSH and LH, follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, testosterone, and inhibit. Now those five uh, hormones have to together accomplish three main tasks. First of those tasks is spermatogenesis. So they're involved in the making of uh, functional sperm. Number two is maturation and development of the reproductive tract, the delivery system for those sperm. And then finally, being able to make sperm and deliver them do you no good if you can't attract uh, a mate, so sexual attraction. Those are the three primary tasks of those five hormones. So first, let's look at spermatogenesis. We're going to start our story up here with the hypothalamus. And uh, initially, uh, during childhood, the hypothal this, these hypothalamic regions aren't active, but at puberty, there's something about puberty, and I don't know what it is, that stimulates this region of the hypothalamus to begin releasing gonadotropic releasing hormone. So what is it about puberty that causes the changes that are seen with puberty? It's that gonadotropic releasing hormone is finally being released, secreted. It's a polypeptide hormone. That's what's been keeping puberty from arriving. So our hypothalamus begins to secrete gonadotropic releasing hormone, GnRH. So what does the GnRH do? Well, one of the things GnRH does is stimulates, it goes into the hypophyseal portal system and from there stimulates the release of LH, luteinizing hormone, from the anterior pituitary. Well, what does LH do? Remember, it's a polypeptide hormone and so it's going to be exocytosed when the GnRH is present and circulate largely freely in the blood and what LH is going to do is bind to cell surface receptors on Leydig cells in the testes. And as a result of binding to the cell surface receptor, we're going to activate second messenger systems inside the Leydig cells. And as a result, we're going to start to convert cholesterol to pregnenolone because the LH is going to stimulate desmolase activity. And the pregnenolone is subsequently converted to androstenedione and the androstenedione con converted to testosterone. This is happening in the Leydig cell. And once testosterone is made, 
because it's a steroid hormone, it will diffuse into the blood. Now we have testosterone in the blood, and as it circulates in the blood, and much of it will be bound, but as it circulates, a percentage of it is converted from testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. And dihydrotestosterone is the more active form. So testosterone becomes
So it's, it's, a, it's an interesting disease in that respect. So dihydrotestosterone, conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone, five buffer rapids and enzyme, is very important in um, sex determination during fetal development. Okay. Testosterone. Now, what does dihydrotestosterone do? Well, in terms of spermatogenesis, it needs to be present to convert a primary spermatocyte into a secondary spermatocyte. Now, to put this in context, we start with cells called spermatogonium. They're four in complement. And those are converted by mitosis to a primary spermatocyte. So it still has four in complement. And then under the guidance or control of dihydrotestosterone, we go through meiosis, converting the primary to a secondary spermatocyte, which is 2N. Now after that, we still don't have a, a functional sperm yet. The secondary spermatocyte undergoes a second meiosis, and now we have a spermatid, so it's now 1N complement. And then finally, in order to get to a sperm, we need to convert the spermatid to a sperm, which is also 1N. So. Okay, so this effect of the androgen dihydrotestosterone to um, initiate what's called spermatogenesis happens after puberty when the testosterone and dihydrotestosterone levels go up because of the activation of the um, hypothalamic pituitary in our basis. The, the, the androgen itself, the dihydrotestosterone, however, is not acting directly on the sperm. There's no androgen receptors in sperm. The dihydrotestosterone is acting on the Sotolvi cells. Now, you remember from Bernie's lecture on Monday, the Sotolvi cells are like the nurse cells that are sort of cuddling these developing sperm. And so it's these cells that are telling the sperm to develop. And it's under the direction of um, testosterone. And you can see an arrow from the hybrid testosterone back to the Sotolvi cell. Um, so the other thing about this system is that males have spermatogonia all the time. So they're, they're, unlike the female, the testis, the seminiferous tubule, has a layer of cells that are diploid and dividing by mitosis. So males never have a menopause where they uh, run out of gametes like women do. Okay? So male fertility extends into old age and until death because there's a, there's a layer of stem cells that are constantly um, dividing to make sure that there's always some sperm cells back. So the meiosis, this is a process of meiosis, continues to happen because there are um, diploid cells at the ready in the seminiferous tubule. Um, but those diploid cells don't start to divide, they, they, they're dormant until human, okay? So it's only when this system switches on, testosterone comes out, it then stimulates the Sotoli cells. The Sotoli cells then tell these spermatogonia, diploid, mitotically dividing cells that will give rise to sperm to start dividing and start entering into the meiotic process to develop sperm. Prior to that, these spermatogonia are just sitting there dormant. Okay, so it's all driven by the brain telling the testes to make testosterone, dihydrotestosterone, and that's driven also by um, FSH, which we'll talk about, I guess, in the next. So, the absence of dihydrotestosterone, development of sperm would end at the primary spermatocyte. Now, what else does dihydrotestosterone do? Well, it's going to feed back and inhibit further release of LH by the anterior pituitary. And it's going to feed back, this is called long loop feedback, 
feedback to inhibit the uh, further release of gonadotropic releasing hormone from the hypothalamus. So once the male hits puberty, testosterone levels go up and then they level off and stay elevated. They're not cycling. Now let's continue the story of the GnRH and go over to the other thing that it's going to do, and that is to stimulate the release of follicle-stimulating hormone from the anterior pituitary. Follicle-stimulating hormone is polypeptide hormone, so it will enter the, its exocytose enters the hypo, uh, hypophyseal portal system and, um, I'm sorry, it enters the blood, circulates in the body, and FSH, primary function, is going to be stimulate Sertoli cells. Now what are Sertoli cells doing? Well, one thing they do is nurture the developing sperm. So they're there to help assure that the energy needs of the developing sperm are being met. In the absence of Sertoli cells, the sperm wouldn't develop. they die off. And specifically, the um, FSH is going to be needed to be able to get the spermatid converted to a sperm. So FSH, beyond nurturing, also has to be present for spermatids to become sperm. In the absence of FSH, sperm development would end at the spermatid, not an active or functional sperm. Um, going back to the dihydrotestosterone, uh, two other things that dihydrotestosterone feeds back to inhibit FSH secretion as well as LH secretion. And the testosterone or dihydrotestosterone stimulates Sertoli cells to be able to reinforce the uh, uh, support or nur nurturing of the developing sperm. Final part to this diagram is Sertoli cells. Once FSH stimulates the Sertoli cells, they begin to secrete their own uh, hormone called inhibin. And inhibin is a polypeptide hormone, and its role is to feed back and inhibit further increases in FSH. So the whole male um, control system from the endocrine side of things is to, once we reach puberty, uh, testosterone levels go up, spermatogenesis levels go up, and then they level off and they stay constant. That's what this wiring diagram would accomplish. Now in terms of the role of these hormones in maturation of the reproductive tract, testosterone, or the act more active form, dihydrotestosterone, is going to stimulate growth of the reproductive structures and maintenance of those structures once they've grown, and then the functional development of those reproductive structures. And the last part, sexual attraction, it's testosterone again, which is primarily important here, and it stimulates secondary sexual characteristics. What do we mean by that? Well, hair patterns, like the development of a beard or male pattern baldness, and the growth of pubic hair. Uh, in terms of voice, testosterone thickens vocal cords, and so you get a deeper voice. In terms of body, uh, testosterone is anabolic. It uh, stimulates an increase in muscle mass and it promotes lean body uh, mass by a decreasing percentage of body fat. It tends to thicken bones to be able to help better deal with the strains and stresses of stronger muscle contraction. And it terminates long bone growth. So when the male reaches puberty, while they do exhibit a growth spurt, 
also signals the onset of where we're going to stop being uh, growing. Um, note here, gastric. So all these functions of testosterone and dihydrate testosterone locally um, serve to change male phenotype. So it change, as, as Tim said, it, it, it induces secondary characteristics of maleness. Okay? So um, a lot of these things happen up. Obviously, we know this happens up in puberty. Why do we all have pubic hair and axillary hair? Why is that common between males and females? You know what I'm you remember back to your adrenal lectures when we were talking about the adrenal gland. So what the adrenal gland produces mainly is aldosterone to regulate salt excretion from the kidneys and blood fluid balance. Cortisol, which is staying alive hormone, stress, uh, uh, metabolism, and one other hormone coming from the inside layer of the adrenal cortex called um, dehydroembryosterone, which is a weak androgen. And that's made in really high amounts um, during fetal life and also uh, at just before puberty in humans, in us, there's a process called the adrenarche where the adrenal starts making all these adrenal androgens. Now, as it turns out, the hair follicles on your pubis and under your arms are highly sensitive to androgens. And so that small amount of androgen, testosterone-like steroid hormone that's coming out of the adrenal early on pre-puberty, pre before puberty, is enough to stimulate pubic hair and so, you know, it's not just testosterone, it accelerates pubic hair growth and, and in women who have polycystic ovary disease, for instance, where their uh, ovaries are making too much androstenedione, by too much androgen, they start showing male pattern hair formation. They, they, it's called hirsutism. They'll actually start growing a beard or something. If the, 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 hyperandrogenemia, too much androgen goes up too high. Okay? okay. So just recognize, yeah. What was the weak androgen that you mentioned? The weak, so there, there's two weak androgens that, that come out of the adrenal gland. Dehydroepiandrosterone, DHEA, which by the way you can buy at Costco and health food stores. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 and and interesting diet. The DHEA story is very interesting because when it was measured in the blood, oh, in all of us sitting here right now, or you guys sitting there standing, the highest, the most abundant steroid in our blood right now is DHEA. Our adrenals are pumping out bucket loads of it when you compare it to other steroids in our, in our system. And we don't know why. Right? We don't know why our adrenals do that other than to have this thing called an adrenarche where we have adrenal maturation prior to that adrenal maturation. Um, when it was measured in the blood of people, it turns out that your levels of DHEA kind of start to go down as you get older. My levels are probably lower than your levels because I'm an old man. All right, it goes down as you get older, and as it turns out, just before you die, it reaches its lowest levels. So people in the 70s and 80s decided that this was the, the hormone of youth that if we keep it elevated, we'll stay young. So consequently, people figured out how to synthesize DHEA from yams, you know, because various natural sources of DHEA, and they were able to extract it from yams, put it in a pill, and they sell it now at health food stores. And you can buy it by a 44 gallon drum at Costco. But the thing is, if you look at the steroidogenic pathway, DHEA is one of these precursor steroids that can be converted to testosterone or estradiol. So if you take DHEA, you're actually increasing the, the amount of precursor that your body can use to make either testosterone or, um, or estrogen. Okay? So when my sister was going through menopause, her GP, her doctor, recommended that she take some DHEA as a source, rather than take estrogen, 
Estrogen replacement therapy is a treatment for menopause and women. They have hot flashes because their estrogen and progesterone levels are going down. So one of the therapies is to do estrogen replacement therapy. That's controversial because it increases the risk in some women for cardiovascular disease and for a cancer of uterine cancer if it's unopposed estrogen. We'll talk about that when he talks about the female reproductive system. But it turns out that if you take DHEA, your estrogen levels go up because you've got more precursor to make estrogen. The doctor said to my sister, you know, when you start, I, we don't know how much you should be taking, but if you notice that it's beginning to grow a, a moustache, cut back. And I thought, well, that's wacky. You don't want to start growing a moustache. So I recommended that she, she stop taking that. It's, anyhow, she got through menopause okay. Um, so just know that these steroids are really potent. Testosterone, dihydrotestosterone, and estradiol, they, they change us. They make us be what we are at puberty. Testosterone poisoning we have as males, I always say. It, it causes you know, all these aggression, uh, you know, muscle mass, it's anabolic. So if you were a, an Olympic Bulgarian weightlifter and you decided to take anabolic steroids in order to build your body mass, your muscle mass, what would happen to your reproductive system? Anybody? Tell me, based on, let's go back to Tim's Based on this diagram, this wiring diagram, what will happen to this guy that's taking all this exogenous anabolic steroid testosterone, let's say it's, he's taking the dihydrotestosterone, the most potent natural anabolic steroid, male steroid. Will these cells stop making it? Will these cells stop making it? Yeah. So these feedback loops are very sensitive. So if you're taking this stuff from the outside, your brain doesn't know where it's coming. So you'll get a negative effect here on the hypothalamus and a negative effect in the anterior pituitary. All right, so now you're going to shut down LH. So if you shut down LH, the lating cells aren't going to do anything because they don't need to. There's already plenty of testosterone there, all right? Okay, but look at this. You're also going to prevent this synergistic effect of testosterone necrosage on the Sertoli cell. So now the Sertoli cell is going to shut down. So what's going to happen there is that you're not going to have any spermatogenesis. So males taking steroids, you know, anabolic steroids at the gym, end up being um, sterile. They can't make sperm because the Sertoli cells are shut down. They still have the capacity to make sperm. They still have those diploid microbially dividing spermatogonium in the testis, but they've just gone back to sleep as if it was pre -converted. So these, these drugs, these androgen receptor hormones, anabolic steroids, are very potent and they're part of our uh, reproductive physiology. You don't want to mess around. You don't want to be taking those, those things. Even the HEA, I would recommend. You know I have some of them as long as I approve my squash in there. Didn't go. Any event. Here we go. Let's continue with this lecture. Removal of the testes yields eunuchs. Eunuchs are because no testes, they'll be sterile. They tend to have an increased percentage body fat because of lack of testosterone. Vocal cords aren't as thick, so higher voice. And this used to be done for castrati singers to maintain that, that high level of high-pitched voice or done for harem guards so that they weren't impregnating the women in the harem. So, you've all seen, you know, comedy skits where somebody gets uh, kicked in the nuts and their voice goes up. That doesn't happen. Once, once the vocal cords are thickened, you can remove the testes, they're not going to run. Right. So in order to maintain soprano, male soprano, the testes have to be removed before puberty so that they do not pick. 
So once a lot, once a lot of these um, male secondary sex characteristics are sort of terminally differentiated, if, if testosterone deficiency doesn't lead to a higher voice in males. It will, however, in part lead to muscle wastage, but really, athletes who are taking testosterone if they just sat around eating bonbons on their couch, watching TV, and popping testosterone pills every day, they're not going to put on muscle mass. What the anabolic steroid does is that it helps in the repair process. So when you go to the gym and you're pumping iron, you are breaking down muscle fibers, and then the body's repairing those muscle fibers and repairing them a little bigger. Okay? muscles end up a little bigger. With testosterone on board, that time it takes from breakdown to repair is significantly reduced. So you end up with a, it just speeds up and amplifies the repair process. So the Bulgarian weightlifter isn't just sitting around, it, what, what happens is all of the muscle mass that they would be putting on because of the, 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 the exercise and the, and, and the workout is made more efficient by the increased testosterone. Okay? And that's in general why, why, why men can go to the gym and work out and get a lot bigger than women. So, uh, more about the uh, vocal cord thing again. I just had a question. So you said that for a male soprano to have a higher voice, you can remove the testes and it will, uh, before puberty, and they can have a higher voice. But then after that, I think, I don't know if I'm concerned, but you said testosterone deficiency will not lead to a higher... Yeah, you don't see... If, so, in, in general, um, as men get older, their testosterone levels start to decline. decline not, not back to pre-convertal levels, but it declines. But if you were to castrate a 40-year-old man... Oh, so like later in life. Later in life, and make him completely testosterone deficient, their voice doesn't change. Because it's already in it. It's already changed. Yeah. The, the, the vocal cords have already been terminally differentiated by okay. the energy. But if you do it before puberty, okay. then you never get that. Unless you treat that child with testosterone. Okay. And, and this, this is another, you know, pediatric endocrinologists are constantly, well, one of the common conditions they see are patients where they have either hypothalamic pituitary deficiency and they have to figure out how to, how to therapeutically bring this individual through puberty. And you do that by exogenous steroid hormones, either estradiol or testosterone. Okay? And behavioral changes associated with testosterone would be increased aggression, Okay, roid rage, people taking uh, steroid hormones, and then uh, sex drive or libido. So, if you combine this with what Bernie told us about the actual plumbing of the male reproductive system, from the testis, seminiferous tubule, Leading cells, the cells, sperm being produced on the inside lining of the center of the tubule, and then their passage through the vas deferens, the storage in the epididymis, vas deferens, all the urethral glands, all the other accessory glandular structures that increase the prostate, that increase the fluid, seminal fluid, um, and then the structure of the penis, the process of, of arousal. It's all regulated by these hormones okay? and the neuroendocrinology of reproduction. Ultimately, it's all regulated by higher centers in the brain and Dr. Tim didn't uh, explain what actually initiates puberty. Okay? So we still don't really understand that. What we think is happening is that there are higher centers in the brain that develop around the time of puberty that then release 
So there's this thing called the gonadostat. There's a suppression, an active suppression of the hypothalamus so that GnRH is not being made prior to puberty. And then eventually that is released and now GnRH positivity can be increased. By the way, the, the GnRH that's made by the hypothalamus is secreted in pulses. And it has to be secreted in pulses or else it doesn't work. Okay. And one of the things that was discovered early on in the piece where people discovered GnRH and then they started giving it back to animals to see what it does. And they gave it back in continuous infusion. Um, the whole system, the whole reproductive system shut down. And the reason for that is that the gene that's made by the hypothalamus acts on receptors in the anterior pituitary. And when it binds those receptors, those receptors are then internalized. The signal is transduced, the receptors internalized, it's degraded and a new receptor is made. If you keep hitting that cell with the hormone, the GnRH, then the whole thing just desensitizes and the number of receptors on the cell surface just decrease and it shuts down. This is important. It's used therapeutically in women and in men in situations where you want to shut down the reproductive system. Now this could happen in men with prostate cancer if you know that there is that the, the, the enlarged prostate is being driven by testosterone. So you want to shut down reproductive system while you give them a GnRH agonist. And the reason why GnRH is used is because it's just a 10 amino acid polypeptide. So it's a 10 amino acid peptide. It's very short and so the drug companies have had a field day with it. They, you know, take the big part and make all these different analogs by replacing one amino acid with another and seeing what effect that has on function. So there's a lot of GnRH analogs on the market that you can give therapeutically okay. to downregulate these FSH and LH um, target cells and shut the reproductive system down. So, you know, the GnRH is, is the key hormone. Now, the other interesting thing here is that the cells that produce the GnRH in the hypothalamus, there's only a couple of hundred of them. So our whole reproductive system is driven by a couple of hundred cells in our hypothalamus. And those cells, during embryonic development, are derived from the olfactory bulb. They migrate down from the olfactory bulb to the hypothalamus. So there's a link there between smell and reproduction, which we know exists in other species. And dogs are constantly sniffing each other's butt to see who's, who's going to be friendly to them. But it, it just makes you think about how in our evolution there was probably a strong link of, and there probably is right now, we're just not aware of these experiments, at least on you know, smell and reproduction. Um, there's a, a disease called Kalman syndrome in men where these cells fail to migrate to the hypothalamus from the olfactory bulb to the hypothalamus. These are XY males who basically have, uh, are infertile okay? um, because they don't have any GnRH. All right, so that's any questions on the male reproductive system? Let's see what's next. Look at female reproductive analogy. For female okay. reproductive endocrinology. So, FSH and LH, they were named because they were discovered in women first. And they were named because FSH causes follicle development in the ovary, and LH causes luteinization of that follicle after ovulation. We talked about that. They're exactly the same hormone in males and females. So don't let the name, obviously males don't have a follicle and they don't lose right. But they're exactly the same.
similar to what we saw for males, except in this case, we're going to need to use eight hormones to cover not only what the males need to accomplish, but also to cover what needs to occur with gestation and uh, subsequent delivery. So we have eight hormones. They're gonna be gonadotropic releasing hormone, FSH and LH, just like we saw with males. Uh, estrogen and progesterone, which fulfill some functions similar to what need to be fulfilled by males. And then the last three, human chorionic gonadotropin, uh, prolactin and oxytocin are all important uh, if we have gestation and delivery of a baby. So these eight hormones have to accomplish five tasks rather than the three for males. First three are equivalent to what we saw in males, and that's to produce eggs, oogogenesis, sexual maturation for, to allow for pregnancy to occur, sexual attraction to attract a sperm donor, and then the last two, gestation and milk production or lactation. So we need to account for all five of those functions. Now, unlike in the male, we see cycling of reproductive structures okay, and cycling of the hormones. So that's going to be a little more complex than in the male where once puberty occurred, spermatogenesis started and continued at a relatively constant rate. It goes down over time with age. But uh, here we have cycling occurring. Tissues which cycle are the ovary, specifically follicles in the ovary, and the endometrium of the uterus. So here's my initial wiring diagram. We're going to start with the hypothalamus. And once again, like with males, at the onset of puberty, we're going to see uh, the hypothalamus begins to release gonadotropic releasing hormone. That's the key to what's happening with puberty. Now what happens with gonadotropic releasing hormone? Well, one thing it does is stimulates the release of luteinizing hormone. And luteinizing hormone is going to do a couple things. One, it's going to stimulate the development of a follicle. Okay, we'll see the importance of that. Uh, but if each, typically in a single cycle, one follicle will develop, and LH is going to be important for that. The other thing luteinizing hormone is going to do is stimulate fecal cells in the ovaries or within the follicle. And the fecal cell is going to, under, under the guidance of LH and FSH, take cholesterol and convert it to pregnenolone. So LH and FSH are going to stimulate decimalase activity, and we start to produce pregnenolone. Now that pregnenolone, some of it is going to be converted to progesterone. And once progesterone is made, being a steroid hormone, it's going to diffuse out into the blood and stimulate other tissues. Some of the pregnenolone is converted to androstenedione dione and testosterone. And the androstenedione dione and testosterone, those male, uh, what we associate with male steroid hormones, they then can diffuse over to be taken up by granulosa cells. In the granulosa cell, we can take the androstenedione and the testosterone and using the enzyme aromatase, convert them to the estrogens. So estrogen, what we usually say it would be estrogen as a steroid hormone, it's actually a family of similarly structured steroid hormones, the estrogens. It includes E1, which is estrone, E2, which is estradiol, and that's the most, the, the key one, the most uh, active one, and 
an estriol, or E3. And as the air made in those granulosa cells, they diffuse into the blood. Now, GnRH also had, will cause an increase in FSH. And what a follicle stimulating hormone. And what's the FSH going to do? It's going to stimulate the fecal cells to be produced, uh, producing progesterone. And it's going to stimulate the granulosa cells to be producing estrogens. So together, LH and FSH. All right. So a couple of little corrections to this. Um, FSH doesn't do much to peak. So this arrow here should be de-emphasized. But FSH does a lot to bring the most results. Now, think of this as analogous to the male system, whereby the thicker cell is analogous to that lady cell in the male that's sitting outside the seminiferous tumor, that interstitial cell that we talked about. Okay. That's where the testosterone is coming from in the male. It's also where the androgen is coming off from in the female, from the female bone. So the thicker cell is analogous to the interstitial lady cell in the testis. The granulosa cell is analogous to the Sertoli cell, because it's the granulosa cell that is surrounding the gamete, in this case the egg. Just like the Sertoli cell is the nurse cell that's surrounding the gamete, the sperm tips. Okay? So FSH acts mainly on granulosa cells, whereas LH acts mainly on beaker cells. All right? Now in women who have polycystic ovary disease, or hyperfecosis it's sometimes called. Um, they have a situation where they're hypersensitive to LH, and these theca cells are really highly active in the, test, in, in the ovary. And they make a lot of androgen, but there's not enough granulosa cells there to take that androgen and convert it to an estrogen, so you get a spillover of androgens. And that's why one of the symptoms of hyperfecosis or polycystic ovary disease is hyperandrogenemia and you know the things that come with that vegetables and other male like characteristics. Okay? So the point I'm making here is that we need to think of this the two systems are analogous. Um, they're using the same hormones, but they're making different end product steroid hormones. The most important one in the male is estradiol. Don't worry about estrone or estriol. Just 17 beta estradiol is the most biologically active female sex steroid hormone. Okay? Females are also making in their um, ovaries small amounts of androgen, testosterone, and steadione they are rapidly converted to the estrogen, to the 17 beta estradiol, by the neighboring um, granulosa cells. So this is called the two-cell hypothesis for estrogen production by the ovary. That's mainly driven by these two hormones, but it's the FSH follicle-stimulating hormone that's mainly driving the granulosa component. And then later on in the cycle, that we'll talk about we have LH. Um, okay, so let's continue. H responsible for producing progesterone and estrogen. Now, this is going to, and it's a complex wiring system, but this is going to be participating in producing the cycling of the follicles and, and that occur in the ovary and cycling of the endometrium in the uterus. We're going to use a 28-day cycle for this model. Uh, it can vary widely between individuals and even within an individual, but we'll say 28 days. So here is a pictograph of a one-month cycle, a 28-day cycle. And what we can see
see here is we're going to draw, if this is day zero, and this is day 28, what I have here, the way I'm approaching it is at the very end of this cycle is when we're going to have menses. So day zero is the beginning, it's the, the day after the last day of menses. And we're going to draw right down about the midpoint, which would be about day 14, is when ovulation is going to occur. And then finally, I'm going to divide this pictograph into an upper and a lower half. The upper half is what's happening in the ovary, and the lower half is what's happening in the endometrium. So we're going to begin at day zero. And at day zero, we have a follicle. It's existed since birth. Okay, and in the follicle, we have the precursor of the ovum. We'll just label it ovum. And then we have fecal cells, and we have granulosa cells. Granulosa cells are going to be a source of estrogen. Okay, so that's not quite right. So the follicle in all females from about mid gestation and old fetuses, in their ovaries, these germ cells, these cells that are going to become eggs, have developed. And all the eggs that a female is ever going to have were developed by you know, 20 weeks of gestation. Because unlike in the male reproductive system, where these, the diploid spermatogonia are always present, dividing by mitosis, you all understand the difference between mitosis and meiosis. Okay, so when you might, so in males we have those germ, those stem cells for spermatogenesis that are always dividing. In the female, on the other hand, all those. Oogonia, all those diploid, mitotically dividing germ cells, those, those, those cells that are destined to become eggs, enter into meiosis during the first trimester of pregnancy. So they enter into meiosis and they migrate to what's called the gen general ridges in the embryo where they're going to be settling down into the structure of the ovary. And when they get there, what they do is they surround themselves, or they get become surrounded by one layer of granulosa cells. So you've got an egg with one layer of granulosa cells surrounding it. That's called the primordial follicle. And that's sitting there in your ovary, if you're a woman, from, you know, end of the first trimester, early second trimester when you were a fetus. And there are around five mid gestation by 20 weeks, there are around 6 million of these in each ovary, so you've got about 12 million of them. By birth, that number has decreased to 500,000, or to, uh, sorry, to about 1 million in each ovary. By puberty, they're decreased to 500,000. By the time you get to the age of 45, 50, 55, there ain't any left. So why is this happening? Why are they killing themselves? Which is what they're doing. But just know that um, here's those primordial follicles I was talking about. So the ovary is jam-packed with these things. You might have one here, one here, and one sitting next to it. For some reason, this one will stay dormant and just sit there. This one will start to grow a little. Okay? and die, this other one might start to grow a little and grow a little more, but nobody knows what regulates that, but that's happening constantly um, throughout a woman's life, okay? from fetal life to menopause. But mainly, it's these things are dying off, they're killing themselves by apoptosis. Right? So, at any one point, if you ever see a histological section through an ovary, you'll always see um, follicles at all these different stages of gestation, of gestation, of, of 
uh, development. And you'll see corporal here and dead corporal here. Okay? That's because it's all happening dynamically all at the same time. And so what happens is that when after puberty, the levels of follicle stimulating hormone here go up because of the GnRH that's made by the hypothalamus, you are now recruiting out of this pool of growing and dying primordial follicles. From that pool, you can recruit some to grow a little bit more, okay? And develop into what's called a secondary follicle and then a tertiary follicle or an antral follicle that will eventually ovulate. So that takes time. And so one of the things that's sort of misleading about this whole menstrual cycle is that it just looks like this follicle is going from here to here to here in 14 days. Well, it doesn't. Like the, 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 the misleading part of this is that it takes actually three cycles to get from a primordial follicle to a dominant follicle that will ovulate. So what I mean by that is the follicle that's ovulating right now was selected three menstrual cycles ago. Okay? Because there's this pool of, of developing follicles in the ovary all the time. And when the, the FSH comes in and hits them, it's selecting some of those to grow a little bit more. Okay? Then the next cycle, they'll grow a little bit more. And then the next cycle, they'll grow a little bit more until you get to a situation where you've got one follicle that's massive and taking up most of the space of the ovary that will eventually ovulate. Okay? So it's follicle stimulating hormone, this, this light blue line here that is going up during the follicular phase. See the slight increase? And that as that goes up, the number of follicles that are producing estrogen increases because you've got more of these guys around that have granulosa cells that can make estradiol. So consequently, the estradiol levels are going up. But that estradiol going up is having negative feedback on the pituitary and the hypothalamus. So that's causing the follicle stimulating hormone to go down a little. It's completely shutting down the LH. So the estradiol is having potent negative feedback on the pituitary and the hypothalamus. But it's not so potent that you don't have growth and development of a FSH dependent follicle that can ovulate, all right? But look at this, look what LH is doing here. All of a sudden, at around day 12 to, to 13, um, you get this massive surge in luteinizing hormone. What the hell's going on there? Well, the reason that happens is that estradiol, all the wiring diagrams you see estradiol having a negative feedback effect on the hypothalamus and the pituitary. When it reaches a certain level, it actually flips from being negative feedback to positive feedback. Okay? It flips from being negative feedback to positive feedback. And when it gets into the positive feedback mode, you get a surge in, a, in luteinizing hormone and a little surge in follicle stimulating hormone. So now what you've got is a positive feedback loop. Biology does not like positive feedback loops. They end up in, bad, in, in disruptive bad events. The event in this case is that the surge in LH and FSH causes this follicle to just go nuts, the dominant one, and ovulate. So it's the surge that causes ovulation. When ovulation happens, then the remaining structure, so that the egg is pushed out, okay? the remaining structure within the ovary, this ovulated follicle, becomes the corpus luteum. And when it becomes, when these granulosa and thicker cells transition into becoming luteal cells, they make a lot less estradiol. So the estradiol suddenly goes down, and it goes down back into that negative feedback mode. So that causes the LH and FSH levels to go down. So there's there should be a line here called the threshold line when this trial flips from being negative to positive. And it's that flipping that causes ovulation, okay? Now, 
You no longer have a follicle. You have these guys sitting there in the background, but they're not doing much because there's not a lot, a lot of follicle stimulating hormone anymore. But what you do have is this big, juicy, yellow body called the corpus luteum. And what the corpus luteum is doing mainly is producing progesterone with a little bit of estradiol. And it's pumping out a lot of this stuff. And it's pumping out so much that the FSH and LH levels are pretty low during the luteal phase. They're there, they're, 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 they're sort of, they're enough to keep the corpus luteum alive, but predominantly what you have during this phase of the cycle is progesterone coming from this corpus luteum with a little bit of estradiol, okay? All right? Enough to cause negative feedback on the hypothalamus of the pituitary. Eventually, though, the corpus luteum will die. It has a set half life, so it dies off. When it dies off, it no longer makes progesterone and estradiol, so the progesterone and estradiol levels decrease. So now you've got less negative feedback on the pituitary, so the FSH levels can start to climb. And here's the FSH levels going up a little. Okay? When the FSH levels go up a little, they can recruit another pool of follicles from that pool of growing follicles until you get the dominant follicle again. But that's what's happening in the ovary and in the blood. Okay? This is what's happening in the uterus. So you have the follicular phase in the uterus where you've got menstruation and then the rebuilding of the endometrium. And then a little bit more growth in the endometrium, but the formation of the glandular endometrium, the, the, the luteal or secretory phase. Okay? Um, when the corpus luteum dies, Progesterone levels go down, there's no longer support for this structure, you get necrosis and shedding. Then you have to rebuild a new one in order to be fertile again. Okay? So go to Google, find yourself a menstrual cycle image, look at it, follow the, the hormones and the feedback loops. Know that there is a switch to positive feedback in cycle that causes ovulation. Know that, you can get around that, you can understand the measure so. The drop in estradiol uh, at around 14 days, why does that happen? Before it rises, because of. Um, yeah? Yeah. Okay, so it's positive feedback, it's mm -hmm. negative feedback, negative feedback, levels go up, suddenly positive feedback, and it's telling the, the hypothalamus pituitary to start making bucket loads of LH, causes ovulation. When it causes ovulation, the cells in here transition to not making estradiol, but making predominantly progesterone. So all of a sudden, at that point, just before ovulation actually, they will decrease their level of estradiol. So now it comes back to a negative feedback. Okay? Now, with this wiring diagram, we're going to begin up here on the left in the tonic center at day zero. The tonic center is active, and so we're releasing GnRH. And because we're releasing GnRH, it passes into the hypophyseal portal system and from there into the pituitary. The pituitary is being stimulated to release FSH and LH. Okay? Now the FSH at that time is going to be stimulating the follicle to begin to mature. Okay? Saying, hey, I'll find a primary follicle and it begins, the follicle begins to mature. And as that follicle begins to mature, the granulosa cells are releasing estrogen. Okay? You can follow through along that, those lines. Now what does the estrogen do in the wiring diagram? One, it feeds back to the pituitary, that's called short loop feedback, and inhibits further release of FSH and LH. So FSH and LH levels are going to start to drop. And 
two, there's long loop feedback all the way back to inhibit the tonic center. When we inhibit the tonic center, what we're going to do is see a drop in GnRH. Now we can see that down below here. At day zero, GnRH levels are elevated because the tonic center is active. But then the GnRH levels begin to drop because we're going to be uh, releasing estrogen. So at day zero, high GnRH, which causes high FSH and LH, and the FSH is going to be stimulating an increase in estrogen. The estrogen then feeds back to inhibit the tonic center, so FS, uh, GnRH levels start to drop, as do FSH and LH levels. Okay? Now, another thing that happens is estrogen can feed back, and this is positive feedback, and stimulate the granulosa cells to produce more estrogen. So estrogen levels keep going up even though FSH levels are going down. Why? Because they have positive feedback. And so this is the system that we're developing here over the course of the first 14 days. Now, here's the key. Estrogen, when it reaches a key or threshold level, when it finally gets high enough, it suddenly stimulates the cycle center. So estrogen inhibits the tonic center. But when it gets high enough, it stimulates the cycle center. When it stimulates the cycle center, and let's change colors now. When it stimulates the cycle center, okay. When it stimulates the cycle center, what we're going to get is the cycle center produces a sudden large increase in GnRH. And that sudden surge in GnRH stimulates the pituitary to produce a sudden surge in FSH and LH. So suddenly, due to the cycle center, we get a surge in GnRH which produces a surge in FSH and LH. Now of those two, the key here is going to be the surge in LH is what triggers ovulation, the LH surge. Now what else is going to be happening is as the FSH and the LH levels go up, they stimulate, and the LH in particular, stimulating the follicle to, uh, to ovulate. But also, we're going to start seeing uh, the fecal cells in what's now the corpus luteum begin to produce progesterone. part of the female reproductive system and he's going over the uh, 
um, summary. But so I assume that the next video is going to be pregnancy, my favorite time. So let's talk a little bit about Okay, so we've looked at um, so reproductive endocrinology can produce cycling. Um, so you have a situation here where you've got an egg that's being operated, and if it finds a place to implant, the first thing that embryo needs to do is to stop that place where it's implanting from being shed. Okay? You've got to keep this endometrium intact and present in order for the pregnancy to continue. So what does the embryo do? Well, the embryo, one of the first hormones that is made by the embryo that signals to the mother is a hormone called chorionic. It's from the placenta. Chorion is the placenta. Gonadotropin. And it's very similar to LH. And, but it's different in a way in that it prevents the corpus luteum from dying. So if you have implantation or the presence of a, an embryo in the uterus and the establishment of pregnancy, this corpus luteum will not die. And that's controlled by the, the hormone, hormone chorionic gonadotropin. That's what you measure in the pregnancy test when you pee on it. Okay? It's chorionic gonadotropin. It can only exist if there is placental tissue. Okay. So, and what that does is it keeps progesterone levels high. Why is progesterone called progesterone? Because it's progestation. You can't get pregnant and you can't stay pregnant without progesterone maintaining the uterus in this progestation state. Okay. So let's see, you know, see what is going on. Yeah. Um, but Freeze or follicles, and uh, in the uterus, the endometrium. Now, what happens if fertilization occurs? What has to happen during pregnancy? And that's what we're going to look at here. So, in pregnancy, if fertilization has occurred, what we have to do is avoid the onset of menses. Now, menses was produced from the fall in estrogen levels. And the fall in estrogen levels in the blood was due to death of the corpus luteum. And the death of the corpus luteum was due to low FSH and LH levels, helping to maintain those cells. So if pregnancy has occurred... We don't know what causes the death of the corpus luteum. It will die in FSH and LH. Something, there's something about that death and that lifespan that is currently unknown. Well, what we do know is it doesn't die chorionic and the trophies around. We need to avoid the drop in estrogen, and the way that can happen is we need to nurture the corpus luteum to prevent the onset of menses. And the way that happens is the embryo secretes human chorionic gonadotropin, or HCG. One of my goals in life is to remove the H out of HCG. It's totally redundant. Noise the crap out of it. You don't say human progesterone or human any other hormone that we'll talk about today. HCG is a polypeptide hormone, fast onset, short acting. And now the embryo is producing this and it acts like luteinizing hormone. It nurtures the corpus luteum. It keeps those cells continuing to function and continuing to live. And so the cells can, of the corpus luteum keep producing estrogen and progesterone. So it keeps secretions of those going from the corpus luteum. Now, human chorionic gonadotropin then is going to uh, be produced early in gestation and was used to as uh, early pregnancy detection. Its source is in the embryo, and so that would mean if HCG is present, person is pregnant. Um, 
HCG is good, it keeps the corpus luteum going, but it can only work so long. And how long is that? About three months. So HCG keeps the corpus luteum going for about three months. But at the end of the first trimester of pregnancy, the corpus luteum is going to die, estrogen again is going to suddenly drop, and menses could occur. So we have to find some, some way of keeping estrogen levels elevated after the first trimester. And by the end of the first trimester, the placenta itself takes over and can produce estrogen and progesterone to, to nurture the placenta. So we need a it, placenta needed three months before it could produce sufficient estrogen and progesterone. So at the end of the first trimester, there's a handing over of the baton, the ability to produce estrogen and progesterone from the corpus luteum to the placenta. And any time you have this passing of the baton is a time of elevated risk that maybe something doesn't occur correctly. So at the end of the first trimester is the greatest risk of spontaneous abortion occurring. That's why many people won't announce that they're pregnant until after the time of the first trimester where they know that the placenta has taken over and it's doing the job. Now, no additional pregnancy should begin during gestation because both estrogen and progesterone are elevated, inhibiting both the tonic center and the cycle center. So we shouldn't have any more ovulation taking place. Okay, now after uh, gestation, you have delivery. And following delivery, you need to start producing milk. So lactation, so how is lactation accounted for? Beginning with puberty, so at the, after the onset of puberty, the continued presence of estrogen and to a lesser extent, progesterone cycles through each month, they stimulate basal breast development. So the machinery for making milk and delivering milk begins to develop at the onset of puberty because of estrogen and to a lesser extent progesterone. Now during pregnancy, there is a constant high level of estrogen and progesterone. And so what you see is during pregnancy, greatly enhanced growth of the alveolar uh, structures. So we're, now you're getting ready to actually produce the milk. Okay? And that's due to the continuous high levels of estrogen and progesterone. So that's helping to prepare the apparatus for production and delivery, which isn't going to occur until birth. So you don't have any milk yet. So what's happening? During pregnancy, you have high estrogen and progesterone levels, and we said that was stimulating alveolar development. Now, as the alveolar structures are developing, they're the ones re responsible for making milk. Now, the actual signal to make milk is, due, is done by prolactin. Okay, polypeptide hormone of the anterior pituitary. But while prolactin may be elevated and may want to signal to make milk, the high levels of estrogen and progesterone inhibit this. What we end up with then is alveolar growth, but no milk production yet because prolactin is being blocked from doing its job by the estrogen and progesterone. Okay. Once birth occurs, the estrogen and progesterone drop. Because of that, prolactin can start to stimulate milk synthesis. Now, milk synthesis means the milk's there, but we then have to release the milk, called milk letdown, and the hormone that is 
is responsible for doing that is called oxytocin, which is released by the po in the posterior pituitary, another polypeptide hormone. And so when oxytocin is present, it stimulates milk release. Well, what causes oxytocin to be secreted? One key part would be suckling. So suckling stimulates the release of oxytocin, which stimulates milk release. And the baby gets fed. Now suckling also stimulates prolactin release. And because of that, as long as suckling is occurring, prolactin continues to be secreted and milk continues to be produced. Now a couple of points here. One, you may have, if you've had children or seen people having children, one thing that oftentimes is done is they have the baby suckle right after it's been born and checked out. Now it's not because it's going to get any milk, but that suckling causes release of oxytocin, and the oxytocin causes milk letdown by stimulating smooth muscle contraction. It's not just in the alveolar portion of the breast, but it also stimulates uterine contraction, and therefore it's going to promote, uh, help out the uterus to expel the placenta. Okay, another note here, that prolactin inhibits LH secretion, leading some people to think, hey, as long as I'm breastfeeding, I am inhibiting ovulation because I'm not getting the LH surge. It's not a perfect plan for birth control. There may be some effect, but uh, it's not reliable whatsoever. Okay? So the high prolactin levels inhibit LH release and therefore conceivably ovulation. So breastfeeding inhibits ovulation after birth, but it's not a great plan. It's not foolproof. So, um, last five minutes. So, oxytocin, what hormone not only for milk let down, but also for uterine contractions and heart attrition. What he didn't mention was what regulates the time of birth. How does that happen? In most species, it's a decrease in progesterone. Just like you have a decrease in progesterone that causes menses, a decrease in progesterone causes labor and delivery. In women, it's a decrease in progesterone responsiveness of the uterine tissues that causes labor and delivery. Um, oxytocin plays a role in that as well, and it, it's interesting, you know, the old time obstetricians, in order to bring on labour, they would flick the nipples of a pregnant woman. That would cause a bit of oxytocin to be released, you know, that, that Ferguson reflex it's called, and that oxytocin would help to prolong labour. Oxytocin is also used to induce labour. You go to McDonald Women's Hospital, women who are being induced will be given oxytocin which is a, uh, a trade name for a name called oxytocin. Um, you know, lactation is, is essential for our reproductive cycle, our reproductive efficiency, and it's hormonally and structurally linked with the whole female reproductive system. So it, it's put together very nicely. Any questions about anything we covered today? Um, good. If you, if you need any help, just email me and I, I can answer questions. Alright. Have a good rest.